I remember back in that November day of 1979, the very first Open Mind show that I did. It was a new journey for me that night, and we want to pick up that journey. We talked about it a lot. It was the fascinating experience of a gentleman by the name of Billy Meyer, one-armed farmer that lived in Switzerland, that uh, back in 1975-76 just for some reason or another started happened to have uh, an ongoing series of contacts with beautiful ladies who came in spacecraft and talked to him. They identified themselves as being from the Pleiades star cluster, um, a planet up there called Hera. Well, the story was imaginative, but what was interesting about the story and grew more and more interesting was that it was supported by hundreds of photographs and also some movie footage, rock and mineral samples, alloy samples. Marcel Vogel, who was here on the show, Dr. Marcel Vogel, then with IBM, said he had never seen metal samples like that. He had never seen an alloy like that. He had never seen one that could be milled like that. He had a chance to sample those. So there were a lot of things about the Billy Myers story. They led us to believe that there was something very true about it. Tonight, we have with us one of the chief investigators on that case as it uh, transpired, started some time ago, and I'm very delighted to have him with us tonight, speaking to us from Arizona, Mr. Lee Elders. Lee, welcome back to Open Mind. Hi, Bill. How are you? Well, I'm just doing fine, and I'm looking forward to what we have going tonight. Because I think tonight, Lee, we'll have uh, one of the first opportunities to, as our good friend Paul Harvey would say, get the rest of the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope so. A lot of things have happened with uh, the Billy Meyer case. When it first started getting national attention, it was uh, exciting to a lot of people. And then a lot of people decided that this really wasn't true, that the photographs were all rigged, the sounds were wrong. And what went wrong? What happened? Why was that? Well, that's a very complex question. Let me try to answer it this way. In 1978, when we first got involved, we had a lot of pioneering to do. And one of the first things we wanted to do with this case is keep it out of the politically charged atmosphere of ufology. And I think in doing this, I think we create a lot of enemies, and I think a lot of disinformation came down about the case. Well, uh, a lot of enemies in that uh, you didn't share a lot of information with them as the chief uh, chief examiners over there or the people getting into it. That seems to be a lot of the input I had. Well, yeah. that, that's absolutely correct, Bill. Although we did make overtures to one very large UFO organization, we asked them if they wanted to get involved with us. We asked their director. At that time, the answer was no. The reasons given, the long distance over there, we don't have the funds to do it. We don't have the manpower to do it. If you want to pay our expenses, take us with you, we'll be glad to go. At that point in time, we felt, well, Let's pass on this one. Let's go see what we can find out. This is what we did. Later on, when we came back, we started bringing evidence, hard evidence, back with us. All of a sudden, they wanted to get involved. They wanted us to turn information over to them. Certain photographs, certain negatives, metal samples, things of this nature. Obviously, we refused. Now, Lee, I know you're stuck up there in the woods in northern Arizona. I wonder if you could talk a little closer into the telephone there or something. Let me try changing phones here. That might help. Okay. We're speaking to Lee Elders, who, along with Lieutenant Colonel Retired Wendell Stevens, were the chief investigators of this very fascinating case of Billy Meyer. A case now in which there are a number of eyewitnesses. There have been some incredible things that have happened over there. Bill, is this any better? That's 100% better. <laughs> okay. You get an A on that one. All right, so much for the headset. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, where were we? All right, so uh, you were talking with one of the large uh, um, UFO organizations, as my memory recalls, that was APRO, that they wanted to get involved after you started doing the spade work. Yes. And then what happened? Well, you know, going back to that beginning, 
Let's go back in a proper manner here. First of all, Wendell Stevens, retired Air Force colonel, been chasing UFOs for some 30 years. He approached us in 1977 and asked us to get involved with this case in Europe. Approaching us, meaning approaching Intercept, a uh, security firm that I own. I asked him why did he want us involved. He said, well, I want professional investigators. We were honored at the time, but we were not interested. At that time, we were dealing with a lot of multinational clients. And our feeling was, you know, this, the, the feel was so stigma-ridden that we really didn't want to get involved. Wendell was persistent. He went over. He came back. Uh, I noticed a big change in him. And at that point, we decided to throw our hat in the ring because he had brought back a lot of hard evidence. And this excited us. So then we jumped in. We got involved. Our first trip was April 1978. My wife, Britt, and I, Wendell went over, spent five days there. I was impressed by Meyer, but I still wasn't convinced. Uh, I felt that maybe the guy is hoaxing it, but how is he hoaxing it? So at that point in time began about a two-year search, my own search, to try to determine if this guy was real or not. In the meantime, the UFO groups were really on our case real bad. They were claiming we didn't have any evidence. First, they were claiming we were withholding evidence. Then they started claiming we didn't have any evidence. Then later on, claims were made that we'd stolen some of the evidence, meaning from Marcel Vogel talking about metal specimens now. Mm -hmm. So, it, it got deeper and deeper, finally got to the stage. They were no longer interested in looking at any evidence. They became very interested in character assassination. And at that stage, we pulled our horns in, Bill. We said, none of this. We sat on the evidence, and we took our lumps for several years. You know, I have a question that just comes to mind here, Lee. Uh, something I want you to mull over as we take just a little break here. Here is uh, a man who claims to be having one of the most, uh, should be one of the most fascinating experiences the whole world should be deeply interested in. He's talking to astronauts from a very different place. They are telling him many things about our beginnings, about our history, what's wrong in our society, how we can solve it have made offers to do a lot of things for us. And who is it that goes and investigates this? The governments? The Air Force? No, it's UFO groups. Why is that? If this is so, and he had that kind of information behind him, where was Uncle Sam? Where were people who could really, totally get involved and do a first-class job instead of... Not that you didn't, but... Uh, other than, than, than flying saucer groups who happen to have an interest in that. I'm Bill Jenkins talking to Lee Elders tonight. We're talking about the UFO in general, but certainly the UFOs from Pleiades in particular. Is it that the investigation of something which had all of the earmarks of being vitally important to the world was left to just private individuals instead of getting the kind of attention you would think that it should have? in the beginning, you know, this bothered me as much as anything because, you know, Intercept had a track record. We had worked with uh, various government agencies in the past. We knew uh, their modus operandi in certain areas, but we couldn't really see anything on the surface here that indicated that they were involved, that they were interested in this case. But today... Five years later, we're finding out a lot of things. We're finding out that there was a lot of behind-the-scenes activity going on. On the I, part of government? We think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Especially in the metal areas, especially in other areas, especially the hard evidence. The hard evidence, photographs, movies, rock and mineral samples, even samples of hair. Of course, the hair was like anybody else's hair, so you can't really say that that was much evidence there. What's happened to all of that evidence? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, one of the major problems when, as I, well, let's go back to the beginning again, right before Intercept got involved, I told Wendell, I said, look, if we're going to get involved, 
we definitely want to control whatever evidence comes. We want to make sure that it is protected. We want security around this man. We want to protect him because at that period of time, he'd already had some attempts against his time. He'd already had some attempts against his life. So Why had he had attempts on his life? Well, there were many and various reasons. Uh, there was one woman, uh, Billy has never told us who she is, but he said later on she joined their group or became involved with their group. But she tried to shoot him. She felt that he was part of a satanic uh, situation that was developing around the Antichrist. She thought he might be one of the Antichrist because of the seven sisters, the Pleiadian contact. Somewhere in the Bible it mentions, I think, that the Antichrist movement would begin in a, in, in a connection with seven. And a lot of people thought for many years it might be the seven hills of Rome, it might be Catholicism. Well, seven is just permeating throughout the Bible. Totally, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's built upon sevens. Yes. In a very majestic mathematical way. But going back to your earlier question, uh, we did our damnedest to provide security on this, but we ran into a major problem when it came to the scientists. We lost several negs in our negatives because we had to ship them off to scientists. We couldn't get people to come into Phoenix and analyze the material. So eventually we had to begin to trust various scientists. And of course we made some bad choices in the beginning, some bad picks. And also there seems to be some form of an obsessive energy or quality that develops when it comes to the Palladian case. People that get information, that receive information, all of a sudden feel that they don't want to part with it any longer. They don't want to return it to the original owner. Billy ran through this before we ever got to him. He had lost hundreds, hundreds of photographs. It's Souvenirs, as it were. Pardon me? Souvenirs of some sort. Oh, yes, yes. It's like a friend once told me who was in the gold dredging business down in South America. He said, you know, you can take the most honest dredge people that work on these dredges. I mean, they wouldn't steal anything, but yet when it comes to that river and those gold nuggets start coming up through that suction hose, they, get, they see one, they like it, and they stick it in their pocket. And to them, it's not stealing. And I think that analogy held true for this case as well. They didn't feel they were stealing anything. They felt it was in better hands, quote, unquote. So we ran into problems there. And when we did, we started losing material. We lost metal fragments. We lost negatives. We lost a lot of things. Well, some of the pictures that came out of it, um, there have been uh, great cries that they were fakes or that they were models. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's easy to sit back in the United States or any country and look at volume one or volume two and say, my God, those pictures are, they're great. They're beautiful. They're the best we've ever seen, the best photo evidence to date. But, and so many of the so-called, quote, experts said this, they said, but they're too good to be true. And I had the same feelings when, when Wendell brought those photographs in. I'm sorry, when Lou Zenstock brought the first Meyer photographs in to his house down in Tucson, Britt and I, we were staying there with him, and my first reaction, Bill, was, hey, these are too good to be true. We've never seen anything like this. So my, the point of the story is this. It's easy to second-guess things. But I went there... And I walk those sites, especially Hassan Bowl. I've been to Hassan Bowl probably a dozen times. And every time I've been there, the wind is blowing fiercely there. It's always cold. It's windswept. But how a man or anybody, especially a one-armed man, could hang a model there is beyond me. I just rule that out. It was totally impossible. Uh -huh. Then when you see the beamship movie footage, forget it. These definitely are not models. Well, in, in the beam ship movie footage, there is one section, and I, you know, I mentioned that to you, that looks like it may be a model hanging on a string. Until you look at it closely, it doesn't behave quite like a model. Obviously, it was very, very windy. Mm -hmm. And this model also was causing the top of the tree to bend. Right. And uh, that would have to be one heck of a model. 
Well, that's that's a general consensus of uh, a lot of friends that I showed this footage to, and the same thing. Another thing you want to look at in that one segment, you're talking about the segment now where the beam ship flies around the tree and over the farmhouse, right? Right, uh -huh. in, a, in a sort of a circular thing. Right. Now, I realize that Sanjasi, the astronaut, was trying to keep the beam ship in camera range at all time, for it was a uh, photo opportunity for, for Billy Meyer. So she was doing pretty good at that. Well, you know, there's, there's a real mystery to that segment. Uh, I want to share it with you because very few people know this. In 1978, when Wendell brought back the movie footage, he brought back a copy of the 8mm footage. And we must have watched this 20, 30 times in his home, throwing it up on a wall or throwing it up on a screen. And never once in the, that year and a half period did we ever see that tree move with this scene we're talking about now. We didn't see, I never saw it move until the Japanese. NTV arrived at the Meyer farmhouse, and the beam ship footage is compiled of what they shot in Meyer's living room off the wall with their video camera. And that was the first time that we saw the tree move. Number one, we were dealing with Billy's second or third generation copy. His original had already been stolen. But, the, but Wendell had like a sixth or seventh generation copy. And of course, the resolution was so bad, you couldn't see the tree move. So, again, going back to photography, this is one of the things you have to look for, and that's how many generations down are you dealing with. You know, I should mention something here, Lee. We're talking about the beam ship footage. I know many of uh, those in this audience have seen uh, Contact from Pleiades, number one, and perhaps volume two. They both have been published by Genesis 3, which is your company. And now you ha are making available... Uh, a 90-minute home cassette, video cassette, uh, for the people, which includes the movie footage taken by Billy Meyer, mm -hmm. plus interviews with Billy Meyer that the Japanese, uh, the, uh, the group from uh, Nippon Television took. And you were kind enough to send me my copy, which I value, uh, as I did Volume 1 and Volume 2, and they are uh, fantastic. You know what's unique about that footage now? You have to remember, Bill, we sat on that for almost five years. Now, we sat on it during the time when our critics were saying that we didn't have any evidence. <laughs> they were saying a lot of things. But, you know, as it is now, the timing is right, and we're now ready to release it so that the people can see what we've seen since 1978 and 79. And what's amazing about Beam Ship, the movie footage, is the fact there are eight segments of movie footage that are all daylight one segment of night footage but in each segment of daylight footage there's a different scene there's a different situation you have one where Meyer walks into the scene the beam ship is hovering above you have another which is my favorite and others where this well-traveled highway you see this beam ship hovering over it. and you can count four different automobiles automobile traffic that travels beneath the beam ship as it sort of just lumbers there silently just hovering above so it's amazing footage we've never seen anything like this before well i was intrigued by the footage where the beam ship just in a twinkling changes positions <laughs> um and then just disappears <coughs> which so is a japanese which is a part of the uh, the technology of the ship as has been explained to us by wendell and i think uh, you went in that uh, with us one night we also had an, an explanation given to us um, by Edwin Slade, who spent some time with Smith Rudy here about uh, six weeks ago when he was with us. And there you can uh, you can see in these uh, in these tapes that actually happened. Um, so you're making it available for uh, home video consumption, VHS or beta? Huh? Yes, yes, we are. It's the only only ufo and we don't like to use that word ufo anymore and they're ifos i think ifo is much better because <laughs> they identify themselves but we are making it available to the public to let everybody decide for themselves whether this is a model or if it's for real and i, I think that's the key thing to this whole case because i think a certain percentage of the public will always feel that it's a hoax and another percentage will always feel that it's real we've seen these percentages work for five years now 
And one of the reasons we're releasing this is you decide. In other words, after you see it, you decide. And that's all we're asking. Well, one thing, it seems to me, for it to have been a hoax, that Billy Meyer, the little one-armed farmer in Switzerland, uh, way outside of Zurich there, would have had to have been able to access uh, special effects studios that are uh, special effects studios that are uh, at least within range of what we have here in Hollywood, and there aren't any over there. So and, how not, is... and not only that, Bill. I mean, we're talking ten years ago. Right. We're talking 1975 and 76 when he when he uh, gathered most of the hard evidence, and. You know, a lot has happened since 1975 and 76. Today, we can look at the shuttle, for example. We know that they're creating metals in space and crystals. So that's no biggie. But in 1975, it was. I mean, a cool fusion process for metal. Come on. And this is what blew the scientists away. It was a cold roll way of making uh, an alloy. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how or why we should do anything like that. That's right. There's some question about whether there was calcium in it or not. There were traces. Uh, there was also, th uh, also thulium. And this, I think, really disturbed Vogel more than anything else. I just, I just finished editing our next tape, and it's uh, called Beam Ship the Metal, and we're releasing the metal analysis, and most of it is, uh, was footage taken at IBM when Vogel was with IBM in his laboratory there. Mm -hmm. And most of it is microscopy work uh, combined with interview with Yowie. And it's fascinating because this first piece, uh, Vogel remarks over and over, he cannot get over the purity of, of, of this material, highly crystalline material in metal, unheard of. Why would anybody want to do that? And it was a great deal of lead and copper and brass and things that you wouldn't think would be in a flying machine, but all great conductors of electricity. Yes. Very fascinating stuff. And we have a lot more for it to go with you. We're just getting started on Open Mind tonight. With me is Lee Elder speaking to us from Alexandria, too. And Lee, I think they have the beam ship tape there, in fact. I think they do, yes, sir. And uh, I don't think they can keep it because everybody wants to see it. <laughs> I hope so. I, I thought we might take just a moment here, if you don't mind. You sent me a fascinating piece of audio tape. And uh, I want to share the sounds of uh, the spacecraft. And, Lee, I'd like for you to set the scene of what we're going to listen to here. Okay, the setting is 1982. The sound analysis one is one of our last priorities, Bill. We had already been... Oh, we'd spent about three or four years on the photos. But this is radio. Pardon me? I says, but this is radio, so <laughs> Right. The sound analysis is important to us. Yes, and uh, we finally got around to it in 82. There had been some preliminary work done by Delatoso and others, but in 82, we took it into Los Angeles to a laboratory there, and we had two gentlemen really look at it, look at it close on their equipment. And coming up, you will... Uh, probably hear my wife Britt, she was present, and Wendell Stevens, and Steve Ambrose, and Niels Rognerud. What uh, what uh, lab was this? This was Excalibur Studios in uh, North Hollywood. All right. So you're there, and, and it's this, this just, just sound tape you're working with that Billy Meyer had recorded. Yes. And uh, this he... is variation. This is the second tape that he had made, the first tape it was about 40 minutes. It was on Variation 2, the craft, and this is on Variation 6. It's interesting, as this contact went along with Billy Myers, that they kept coming up with new models of the spacecraft all the way through. Well, you know, to an investigator, this has to blow you away, because every time we'd get this guy in one arena and think we had him surrounded, you know, like still photography, he would jump into another arena. He would take us there like uh, sounds or metal. Mm -hmm. And it became a never-ending chase. So, uh, anyway, it was a fascinating experience, and, and coming up is this tape. All right. I want to share this moment with you as you're listening to the investigators themselves, as well as sound engineers, uh, dealing with the perplexing things that they are seeing on their scopes as they listen to the sounds of the Variation 6 Pleiadian spacecraft. Yes. 
being demonstrated by the sound engineers as they heard these uh, sounds that Billy Meyer recorded of the later. Mm -hmm. But he said uh, there certainly aren't any synthesizers that have oscillators that are that many, you know, and can be randomly tuned to that many uh, different type of frequencies. Another thing is they found out that one frequency that remained stable throughout the entire testing was, well, they compared it to the Schumann resonance factor. Well, they compared it to the Schumann resonance factor. Mm -hmm. That's a natural frequency of Mother Earth. 7.85. Very interesting question. A 7.85 hertz wave that stayed uh, consistent all the way through. Right. And uh, so it just kind of adds a little sauce for the goose here, doesn't it? Well, there's something else, too, that I don't know if you're familiar with or not, and I'd like to get into it with you without naming names here. It is very sensitive information, but, okay, in 1982, we did the analysis you just heard. In 1980, uh, we shipped the sound tape of Variation 2 to a friend, Rob Shellman, who came to us in, 19, I think it was 1979, through April. Rob was in the Navy. He was stationed at a naval base on the East Coast. At this base, they had a computer where they carried what they call sound signatures within the computer. It was primar primarily used for identifying various sounds in the ocean, such as submarines. They ran these sounds through the computer. Now, this computer supposedly had sounds of everything in it. <laughs> it couldn't match the sounds of variation too. We found this extremely interesting. Now going back to your point, here we've got a one-armed man, handicapped, sixth grade education, handicapped, and he, if he's hoaxing it, he's fooling us at every turn. Not only is he fooling us, but he's also fooling science. He's fooling our most sophisticated computers. Exactly. Well, he is really quite a fellow, isn't he? He is a great guy, warm human being. He's never been at, in, into this for personal gain. Now, you're talking to a man here that spent many hours with Billy Meyer, many days. Our whole investigative team spent almost 300 days living at the farmhouse over a period of five years. And we never detected any trickery. We never uncovered anything uh, smacking of hoax. Well, I think it's interesting in watching the tape that you are now making available to the public. You, um, Yowie does uh, uh, interviews uh, Billy Meyer, and you walk with Yowie and Billy Meyer to the uh, various locations there in Switzerland where so many of these sightings were made. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just can't help but fall in love with him. Uh, he's so warm and he's so gentle and he is so real. And he seems a little bit perplexed why people are having difficulty in understanding what... He's trying to tell them. You feel for him. You really do. Well, that's what's amazing about the man in 30... Now, I'm, I'm not a UFO expert. I was never into UFOs prior to this case. Sure, we... I believed in him. I believed that other life was possible. But Intercept definitely was not a UFO investigative company. Uh, when we got involved with the Meyer case, as I say, for two years, we tried to figure out how he was hoaxing it. But we finally gave up because it, it became easier and more practical to believe that it was actually happening than it was that if he was hoaxing it. It would have required too much money, too many accomplices, too many unexplainable situations such as the metal. How mm -hmm. did he produce that? And other issues. So well, I think the story of the hoax would be greater than the story of the content. Oh, I agree. Definitely. <laughs> The, uh, the folks are beginning to line up on the phone. I know they have questions. I have found over the years, Lee, they're, the, they're far better interrogators than I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I just become a, a traffic cop. I know that there are questions about about the Billy Meyer case. I'd like for you to kind of limit them with Lee, if you will, to uh, the Billy Meyer case, what is being said there, uh, the hard evidence. Uh, if you want to ask about the tape, certainly any of those things. We will play some more of this sound tape for you, so if you... You missed it the first time, went get it the second time, get your tape recorders rolling as far as that goes. And we'll get to your calls in a second. Let me give you the number. Los Angeles, five ground still to cover about the Billy Meyer case, a contact case with people from Pleiades, and we have just the guy to answer those questions on the line. He's Lee Elders, and I believe we have 
Roger is up. Roger, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. The question I'd like to ask is, what book or what material is available as to the lessons that uh, Billy Meyer received from these people as to what we should do on this earth to get ourselves out of our mess? Mm. Good question, Roger. That's a good question. <clears throat> there were some contact notes made of the case, but those have not been translated in their entirety as yet. Uh, he did them in German, as I recall. They're in Swiss German, yes. And some of them have been translated to English, but are not enough at this time to warrant a publication. Also, I might add that there is, we're under contract now. We have, there's an option on this material, and we cannot release anything for another two years. The reason? There is currently a mainstream book being written on the case, and it should be released within, oh, 12, 14 months. But it does go into, uh, Roger, to answer your question, uh, what the Plodian Sea is our plight. They have enormous suggestions for us and um, where we should be going, and it really starts at home. Oh, sure. Oh, sure, yes. That's, that's the yeah, In each individual. That's right. Uh, you'll find a very metaphysical ring to a lot of the things that they have to say. Right. And one of the key issues that we... Uh, we utilized in, in the movie footage video was the fact that Meyer was talking about balancing the material with the spiritual. And yes. if you really think about that, I think that's one of the key ingredients what? necessary today is to try to balance those two. Right. Does that answer your question? Well, it does. I just was hoping there would be something out now. Do you know of other sources of... Uh... The, you know, which have the same message probably from other ways, because let's face it, there's, there, this, coming, this stuff's coming from a lot of different ways. Oh, no question. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of individuals channeling various information. Right. I've heard of one up in the Seattle area. I, the name escapes me. Uh, they're channeling information on how to help this planet, how right. to help mankind. I think that's the bottom line. Yeah. Of, of what this whole thing's about. Sure it is. We're in trouble. This planet's in trouble. We know this. Now, what can we do about it? Not what can they do about it. What can we do? No, we've got to do it ourselves. Right. That's, that's, you're absolutely correct. Well, it's good to hear this, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Roger. Appreciate uh, you getting in on that. And uh, let's. we have time to get you started, Bob. Go right ahead. Okay, Bill. Thank you. I have a question for Lee. Uh, it has to do with the uh, beam ship video. Yes. An hour into the, uh, by the way, which was quite excellent, and I enjoyed it very well, much. Oh, did you see it? Pardon me? I say, do you have a copy? Yes, I do, uh, Lee. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, an hour into the video, you showed a tree that was struck by a laser, and shortly thereafter, Billy Myers mentioned a cosmonaut by the name of Minora. Mm-hmm. Do you remember this name? Yes. What can you tell me about this cosmonaut Minora? If anything, I have a real personal, a real good reason for asking. Yes, thank you, Bill. Yes, Lee, I, as I mentioned, I was asking about the cosmonaut Minora. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm asking is, and bear with me, this is, I'm going to agree, this is hard to swallow. I uh, met with her out of body three years ago, and she introduced herself. You, you went out of body, Bob? <laughs> Everybody yes. in Los yes. Angeles goes. Yeah. Uh, Actually, there's quite a bit to it, but I'll keep it real short and real simple. And I met with her in Switzerland, out of body. She introduced herself as Minora. At the time, though, I thought she said Mora, but after I saw your video, I realized it was Minora. And we had a conversation, and, and uh, she even had an assistant and an android with her. But she didn't tell me anything about herself. I was wondering, spending three years with Billy Myers, or five years, can you share any insight with me? We know very little about Manara, also Playa. That was another one mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I'm not positive, uh, because there's very little mention about her, but I do believe that she was or is a Lyrian cosmonaut. She was not from the Pleiades. Mm -hmm. Meyer claims to have had several different contacts with various civilizations, Pleiades being one. Mm -hmm. The Dals, that's spelled D-A-L-S, being another, they sort of prepped him for his uh, plating experience ten years prior, mm. and then the Lyrians. 
Now, I might add that this is, uh, these are some of the reasons that uh, the so-called UFO experts back in 1978 felt the case was a hoax. There was just too much to it. There were too many, you know, outside stories, too many contacts with other civilizations. If he could have held it to the Pleiadians, it would have made life a lot easier for the investigators. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when um, Edwin Slade was over there, he came back with a fascinating story, Lee. I don't know whether I've even had a chance to pass it on to you. But he was talking to the hands that work around there. They showed him footprints. It seems to be sort of a way station now, and some of the people that come down and spend a while are very people that come down and spend a while are very large, and some are very small. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just that the, the word is out that this is sort of a safe place that they can come. Well, you know, one of, we entertained this idea back in 78 and 79 when we were faced with these facts. Now, obviously, we were searching for some kind of rational explanation. I mean, nowhere in the history of ufology has an individual had so many contacts over a period of time with different societies. And one of the things that we were checking into at that period of time was the fact that there might be, in this area, meaning in the Schmidrudy area of Switzerland, maybe some kind of time warp in that place, something like the Bermuda Triangle, uh, that would create this type of situation. In other words, it might be a beacon area for various spacecraft coming into our civilization. And therefore, maybe Myers in that cosmic phone book, who knows? Hmm. Yeah, uh, Bill, if I can just say one thing, I'm sure there's a few viewers out there that... <laughs> well, if they are, this is really the open mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I say, I'm sure there are some out there that obviously just can't accept with what I just said. Um, I will say this, the android that was with her, I watched this android burn a circle in my nail, and when I came back to my body, it, the circle was in my nail. I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. He burned a what? A circle. A circle. A perfect circle in my fingernail. In your fingernail. And I, I actually felt the pain out of body. That's unusual. Yeah, highly unusual. Cause, um, and when I, even more unusual, when I returned to my body, the circle was there. That's very unusual. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Do you have a copy of the old Wendell Stevens book? Of UFO Pleiades? Uh, it was like his diary. He only published a, a small number of them. The Green Books. The green ones. No, this I was, don't. Uh, UFO contact from Pleiades uh, investigative uh, summary. Well, well, I don't have the summary. I have the uh, hard cover. Okay, you don't have the preliminary investigation report. No, I'd love to have it. Well, it's impossible to find anymore. It's like volume one. It's history, I and see. they're now collector's items. But uh, it's very. Uh, let me share one thing with you that you might find intriguing. Please. We have seen a photograph. We've never released it. We've never published it. On board, supposedly I take him by Meyer, on board the mothership, there are two cosmonauts, both female. One is uh, Aska, mm -hmm. and the other, I'm not sure if it's Playa or Monera at this point, but standing off to the right is an android. Mm -hmm. Could you describe this android to me, since you have not seen this photograph? Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you quite honestly, usually whenever you're out of body, you can see just as clear as, as in body. However, when I met with them, they were uh, they came to me as a silhouette. Menorah, this android, and her assistants came to me. Although I could see the farm where the ship landed, I could see the fence, I could see everything else perfectly clear. I can even see the bench where we sat on. I can even see the clipboard she had in her hand when she was speaking to me. Well, let me ask you another question, mm -hmm. real quick. Mm -hmm. What do you think, what do you estimate the size, height, oh, of the android was? Okay, approximately uh, six and a half feet, seven feet, no more than seven, I would say. Taller than she was? Yes. Yes. Cylindrical? No. C cylindrical is the word, I guess. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, arms and legs or uh, uh, R2 D2? No, no, no. Arms and legs. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I walked up to this android, my arm went up automatically. I had no control over that. He, his arm raised. He grabbed the tip of my nail. That's when I felt the pain. I, that's when I said to myself, "You can't do this to me." Uh, it was like talking to a machine. He didn't even listen to me whatsoever. I sat down with Menorah. We had a conversation which, which would blow your mind. And she got up, went back to her ship, 
and I tried to take control of the situation, and I was back in my body. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a mind blower, and it happened. As a matter of fact, this February will be three year anniversary. Uh, February 9th. How does that stack up with the android in the picture? I'd like to, I'd prefer to discuss that in private with this gentleman. Why don't you drop me a line, a letter, and uh, we'll talk about it. And okay. This way we can move on with some other I understand. What you thought? Just out of curiosity, real quickly, do you know Billy Meyer's birthday? Yes. Is, is it in February? Yes. February 9th? No, February 3rd. The 3rd. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting because, real quick, I... It just, all this didn't happen in one night. It happened over four consecutive nights, and it started on the fourth. So it's, I don't know if there's anything to that, but I thought I'd ask. Well, I'm glad you did. It's very intriguing. I'd like to talk to you more about it. Very well. Okay. Thank all you, right, Lee. Bob. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Bill. And in case you... Uh, good evening, Lee. Uh, hi, Chuck. Uh, just bar I'm barely getting you, but I guess I can't hear you. Um, good evening, Bill. Okay. Um, you know, I, I've... I've had experience with some, uh, what they call, uh, evoked potentials with the brain, okay? And that has to do with hitting the brain with, say, a, a flash of light or a sound and measuring the response to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, um, I was listening to those sounds, you know, the, the sounds of the motors. And, Bill, you brought up the 7.85 or 7.83 hertz mm -hmm. as being always present in those, in those sounds. And then I've had a past experience with, uh, say, with past life regression where I was in a cockpit and seeing that going on. But, see, it didn't hit me until later on that in that the UFOs are totally mentally controlled. And that those sounds you were hearing were really thought were, were, were upper harmonics or higher harmonics of just brain waves. And that when they correlate, that means there is agreement that that's what the pilot wants to happen at that moment, you see? And if you do that, with, if, you, if, if, if you take the same analogy with, with human beings is that at times when they recognize something that is being real at that moment, you can see it peek up on a computer as being rep, that's it. And there's no way you can get around it. You see what I'm saying? The analogy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do. There's been some talk uh, among those who have studied the strange characteristics and the propulsion systems of these and other craft that there could very well be a form of mental control. I think we've even talked about that, Lee. Oh, yes. Well, the, well I was, Lee, how do you feel about the in, interdimensionality of the mind itself? If I say that I want to be on a Pleiades in the next 10 seconds, and if I'm in a, machine, if I'm in a ship that operates in that realm of intention, What's to keep me from going there? Hello? What's, yeah. what's to keep me from going there? Well, it takes them five minutes. I don't know. <laughs> with, the, with the new beam ships. Well, if they can think in concert, in unison, which they can, if they are adept in <coughs> uh, telepathy, okay? Mm -hmm. It's always been Mr. Delatosa's theory, who's worked very diligently on this project in science for many years, that... There's a combination there of thought. In other words, thought is required for hyperspace. Okay? Thought in unison. And Co coherent in thought is in hyperspace. I'm, I'm saying that that is the domain. But uh, what I'm saying is before they jump, uh, the spacecraft jumps to hyperspace. Uh -huh. It requires total unison of thought between all the crew. I see. Okay? And the onboard ship computers. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, do you follow me? Sure. If you want to go beyond that, you'll have to talk to those. Okay. Well, no, I won't need to go. Huh? Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh-huh. You could very well be on it. And uh, further than that, Chuck, we're looking at some of the other sciences that we're dealing with now, particularly whenever we move into this rarefied air known as scalar interferometry. Uh-huh. And right. some of the things that uh, happens there, a great deal depends upon the operator. And uh, we're not well, talking about quantum physics says that the you know you're the observer is part of the process. That's right. And as the sciences now get more pristine and more exacting, uh, we see the uh, the great interrelation between physics and the physics of the human mind. And that the me the message of the Pleiadians, Pleiadians is that we are the process, we are the environment, and it, it, it's not out there, and that we've got to straighten it out. 
Well, they sure have a lot to say about straightening it out, don't they? <laughs> right. Okay, Bill, uh, I just wanted to bring that up to see, you know, make it more mystical. Well, it's not mystical. I like to see it get down to science, and you're you're really touching on some touchstones of uh, the advanced scientific community right now. Right. All right, Chuck, thank you for that input. Appreciate thank, it a lot. Thank you. Okay, Edson, you're on. Hi, good evening. How are you? How are you? Uh, how are you, gentlemen? By the way, Bill, I, too, have had all-the-body experiences. Mm. <laughs> uh, I don't control them. They only happen during very uh, severe emotional uh, times, but if you I look at... I don't, don't hope you have no more. <laughs> well, I hope not, but uh, uh, I'll just briefly mention in the uh, Omni magazine for uh, December, there's a gentleman in Poland who uh, claims that... Uh, out-of-body experiences and, um, uh, you know, death, uh, uh, you know, death, uh, re uh, what is it, uh, when you come back after death? Uh, near-death experience. Near-death experience are related, so... Uh, yes, they are. They're very closely related. Mm -hmm. Floating and so forth. Uh, yeah, well, what I want to ask is, uh, first, has any uh, ultra or infrasonic uh, frequency has been discovered in these uh, tapes of Billy Myers? Uh, what type of frequencies did you have? Uh, ultrasonic or infrasonic? Uh, at this point in time, no. Uh, although, I think it would be best uh, to probably put you in touch with one of the gentlemen that did the work on this. But uh, I don't think there has. But uh, an update on it, I'd be glad to answer that if you want to send me a letter. Okay. And uh, you were mentioning to me about a beacon uh, there in the spot in Switzerland. I suppose Switzerland is surrounded by mountains and Alps and so forth. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Baron von Reichenbach, who's the uh, uh, discoverer of the Otic Force and using crystals to uh, uh, detect this uh, force, uh, obtained these crystals from the Alps, and I think some of them were six, eight, ten feet long, so maybe that has something to do with it. Mm, that could could be. Yeah. <laughs> We've also heard, uh, for example, uh, the Continental Shelf, which uh, I think appears right out, right on the border of New Mexico and Arizona, has been very heavy in uh, UFO activity. I don't know if the shelf is a curiosity point for them, or if it has something to do with electromagnetic uh, waves or what. It's an interesting analogy, though. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps there's something like this in the in the Swiss area. We don't speaking know. Of, speaking of the UFO air uh, activity down there, I got uh, clippings from Tucson newspapers uh -huh. uh, of uh, an event there of what three or four weeks ago, where flights of 60 UFOs were observed for an hour and a half by air controllers, radar, thousands of people in the Tucson area. There they were. Now, they will not talk about it at uh, the flight tower there at the airport. I tried to talk to someone about it. Uh, they have been hushed up, but they were seen. They were reported, well reported everywhere except in Los Angeles. But uh, the folks of Tucson had quite a show. They weren't balloons. They were readily watched on military and civilian radar. Bill, I was with Wendell about three weeks ago. We spent several hours together, and he told me that the following evening after this major flap over Tucson, and I've heard there were, what, uh, four waves of 15 apiece or something like something that. Something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, staggered in between one another. But he told me the following evening, the same formation, the same number was sighted over the Burbank area and Santa Monica area. Well, Have I you hadn't, heard anything about that? I hadn't heard anything about the local flap at all. Obviously, I didn't see it. I'd have been on the radio quite with that, and I'd carry my video camera with me everywhere I go, mm -hmm. and uh, would have gotten some footage. Um, but it's interesting to me how legitimate news media, whenever they have a really incredible, well, I hate to use the word incredible because that means not to be believed, uh, but astounding story like this. I think footage was shown on television in uh, Tucson. And also Phoenix. And Phoenix. Uh, but the great editors of Los Angeles were not interested in that story. It's much better to have a wreck on the freeway on the on the tube. Well, you know, Cora Lorenzen called it, uh, she was interviewed by the local television station, one of them. She called it one of the greatest flaps of all time. That probably is. Uh, 
because she said it was a whole revolutionary new, you know, pioneering phase for sightings. Well, it's similar to the sightings of last summer um, up in northern New York, mm. although those were nighttime sightings, but uh, thousands of people saw that. Mm. And again, wrecks on the freeway were far more important to our newspapers and television stations. Mm. Okay, Edson, appreciate those questions uh, a great deal. Thank you very much. And uh, Bob, you're on. Oh, hi, Lee. Yes. Hi. I, I don't know if you can hear me too well. I can't hear you too oh, well. Oh, you're but... both coming in fine. Okay. Uh, I've had a considerable difficulty locating Volume 1. I saw it, I think, around December of 81 for the first time in a bookstore. Never saw it after that, but it, it piqued my, my curiosity. I looked for it. I had people look in books and print and microfilm, B. Dalton, that sort of thing. Nobody could find it. I finally, oh, two years later, found one defective copy uh, in a bookstore in Thousand Oaks. And I was wondering, has... Is there any type of government, uh, at least uh, interference, or have you been approached by anyone in the government as far as public publishing such remarkable story and photographs? Okay, uh, I think that's a two or three part uh, answer there. First of all, volume one is out of print, has been since 81. Uh, let me go back to volume one. The reason we published it, Genesis 3 was set up, organized and everything with the investigators of this case. When we got involved, we found that the expenses of investigating this case in Switzerland became astronomical. We were into six figures. Wow. Now that's the most. We've spent more money investigating this case than any, uh, I think, ten other UFO cases in the history of UFOlogy. So we had to come up with a solution to finance this investigation. And the solution came about through Volume 1. And the investigators set up Genesis 3. We published Volume 1 as an overview of the case. And we felt, well, we'll be lucky if we sell a couple of thousand. Maybe we can offset some of these tremendous expenses. Instead, it became an occult classic. We found that we have no idea. I'd like to know where mine is. <laughs> However, the beam ship videotape, yes, uh, I think surpasses volume one, and it probably will be a classic unto itself as well. Because, Bob, you not only get to see the pictures that are in Volume 1, or many of them, but you also get to see the movie footage. That's another thing. Um, I was curious as to why uh, this case, as, as explicit as it is in its evidence, has not uh, been detailed at all like in the book by Fawcett and Greenwood, Clear Intent. Mm -hmm. And no one's even mentioned a word of it in there, uh, e even in passing. Uh, and it's, it seems so remarkable. It's, it's almost as if uh, I've shown people and they look at me like... Uh, that's incredible, but uh, is it for real? <laughs> I think one of the reasons is that uh, Larry Fawcett, for instance, just doesn't have the hard evidence at his disposal, so it would be sort of improper for him to make too much comment about it. Oh. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, volume 2, is it uh, going to be as hard to find as Volume 1 has been? Uh, there are limited quantities left of Volume 2. But volume 2, you'll be very happy with it. Uh, I'll keep to. mine under lock and key. <laughs> <laughs> the one I got is, 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 is a... It's a publisher's defect. It's put, you know, a couple of the sections are upside down, but I bought it anyway because it's the only thing I could find after two years. <laughs> and it's somewhat of a collector's item on top of that. Well, Volume 2 is uh, just as excellent in the picture and the photography. It answers a lot of the questions that were unanswered in Volume 1. Terrific. Thanks a lot. All right, Bob. Bye-bye. And uh, we have another Bob on the line. Bob, welcome aboard. Uh, there you are, Bob. Yes. I hit the wrong button. Yes, hi. Uh, I was uh, wondering about this recent flap about six weeks ago I was outside about 2 a.m. and I saw a flight of three oval objects over the San Gabriel Mountains. I live in Pasadena. Now this is three weeks ago? About six weeks ago and it was about <clears throat> 2 o'clock in the morning. Well you know they came right over my house. What was I doing sleeping? Uh, I've never seen anything. They were in absolutely strict formation perfectly uh, spaced out from each other. There were three of them. And they held this formation and skimmed right over Mount Wilson. And you could see them passing in front of portions of the mountain, but actually moving through a cloud layer. There were some scattered clouds. You say they were oval objects? They were, uh, they were oval and they were completely white. And this was nighttime? And it was 2 a.m. So, yeah, it was, they were illuminated from inside, it looked like, like street lights almost, but they were flying. <laughs> were, were they windows or just a normal flying? Uh, the whole shape was lit, uh, shape. Was, was glowing. Uh, very definite oval form mm -hmm. and no sound whatsoever that I could hear at this distance. So they, they must have been about two and a half to three miles away from me. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, it was very strange because <laughs> uh, I never had seen anything like that uh, before in this area, at least. Well, there has been an increase in uh, sighting activity in uh, in Southern California, uh-huh. Arizona, New Mexico, this area. And I was wondering also in, in the films, uh, are there situations where you can see uh, part of the landscape behind the object and portions in front. That's oh. that's what this situation was like. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because I know I've done a lot of films myself with miniatures, and the, the hardest thing to do is to put a large uh, or a living object like a person or a large moving tree or something like that in front of something that's small. That's where you really get into problems. Yeah, the perspective, uh, uh-huh. whenever you really start analyzing the perspective of the craft as it moves towards you and then back, uh, uh-huh. you know you're not dealing with a uh, model. And also shadows. Do you ever see shadows, uh, interplay of the shadows from the vehicle on the ground or on the people in, yes, you do. in the scene? Because I know that's another area where things can get very difficult. Well, you know, uh, Bill, uh, if, if I know, uh, Bill, uh, if, if I could interject one thing here, uh, a story we've heard, I don't know if it's true or not, but if you ever get a chance to talk to Spielberg, it might be worth asking him this, but uh, when he was shooting Close Encounters, we heard that they had spent a lot of money trying to get a daylight scene that looked real with a UFO, and they finally gave up after a large dollar amount. And that's why in that film, all the scenes are night footage, or, you know, uh, or at night time. And so, anyway, at that period of time, this is back, I think it was 78, 79, the studio contacted uh, Mr. Tom Welch. If you ever have Tom on the line, Bill, yes. have him tell you the story. But he and Wendell met with the studio heads over there, and they asked one question. They said, hey, we'll pay Meyer. We'll pay him six, seven figures, and he'll just tell us how he's doing it. I was sitting in Switzerland at the time with Billy in his living room. The phone rang. And now this is the uh, this is the studio corporate headquarters calling, and Wendell and Tom are there. They're with three of the top executives, and the question to me to ask Billy was, "How do you do it?" I asked him. I said, "Look, now Billy, answer this properly, because you know you can send your kids to Switzerland, you know, to a private Swiss school here uh, with the type of money they're talking about. So just be honest. How do you do it?" He thought for a minute, and he said, huh, just tell him it just happens. And that was his answer, so I repeated it to Tom, who repeated it to the executive, and that was the end of that story. But uh, this actually happened. Now, the Spielberg thing, I don't know, but we heard that story. Uh-huh. So uh, you'll find it quite fascinating to look at the footage yourself. if you. Yes, I course. really would like to, because uh, I've been shot a lot of this kind of thing uh, with small-scale models. Uh, I, I would have a, a pretty good idea right away of what I was seeing. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thanks. All right, Bob, thank Bye. you very much for your input. I'm Bill Jenkins. It's Open Mind. Oh, thank you. Hi, Bill. Mm-hmm. Me. Um, the reason I'm calling is uh, I heard the... Uh, Can you speak up just a little bit? Oh, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Uh, the reason I'm calling is that I heard the uh, recorded sound of the uh, ship. We'll do that again also, give you some more of it. Okay. Uh, the thing that kind of interested me was the uh, oh, the fundamental frequency. I believe it said 7.85 hertz. Right in that area, the uh, the Earth resonance, I guess it's generally known as, or, or the Schumann resonance. Now, is that the electrical resonance? No, that's... Uh, um, no, that's a sound. Uh, it's, it's one we uh, can't the natural, hear. Bill. It's a natural resonance of the Earth. It's a, the natural electromagnetic resonance of Earth. It was discovered by Nikola Tesla. Right, right. Okay. And it's uh, it, it varies. Well, his was at 6.6 cycles. Then Schumann came in, discovered a second resonance of 7.8 cycles per second. So you are saying this is an electrical resonance. Well, it would be, uh, yeah, it would be an electromagnetic okay. resonance. It's one of the dangerous resonance, actually, that uh, is involved with the woodpecker sounds that are being broadcast into the Soviet Union, or well, from the Soviet Union to us. Well, let me ask you, Lee, uh, what significance, uh, you know, with your research and stuff like that, uh, what kind of significance do you, uh, you know, attribute to that uh, very low frequency? 
Could you repeat that, Bill? I can't hear. He wanted to know what significance you attribute to the fact that the consistent frequency that is coming up on the scopes is uh, that very low frequency of 7.885. Yeah, that's right. Well, I'm not really qualified to get into this, but basically as a real vague overview, there are a lot of theories. There's a gentleman down in New Zealand, I think, uh, by the name of... Uh, Oh, the name escapes me right now, but he's done a lot of work in that area. But uh, a lot of people feel that the spacecraft are using electromagnetic grid points for their grounding, if we want to call that, so they can ground into this, uh, I don't know if atmosphere is the right word or not, uh, magnetic lines of energy. They seem right. to have a floating effect at some times, as if they are riding these undulating magnetic waves. I think I've read about something like this. Isn't there a guy in Florida who has written a book uh, dealing with uh, this grid system uh, covering the Earth? Got me. I don't know. Uh, the man in New Zealand, his name escapes me, but he's done some work in Harmonics 33 and several other books. Well, maybe it's the same guy. Well, maybe I just thought he was from Florida. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I hope you can get him on your show some night. It would really be interesting to talk to Bill, and that's David Froning, right over in your area in uh, Pacific Palisades. David Froning? David Froning, and he is very knowledgeable in this area, and he's got a lot of theories, and uh, he's done a lot of work, and he's followed the Meyer case for about five years now. Well, and uh, but anyway, uh, if you can get him, it would be an interesting show. I'm always looking for interesting shows. Uh, one further question, please. Um, you know that the uh, sound that you played over the radio, mm -hmm. was that of a ship hovering? I, I didn't hear that. Was the, uh, the sounds that we played, yeah. uh, was the ship hovering? I suspect it was more or less moving around a little bit, but within range of where Billy was recording. Oh, yes. Uh, recording. There's an interesting story behind that recording. Not only was Billy recording, but also his wife, Poppy, was recording. They had the kids were there. There were three or four other people there. They never saw the ship. The ship never materialized during the, the recording. And the recording is like 30 to 5, 40 minutes long. Billy was approximately 150 yards away from his wife. They were separated. Each had a tape recorder, and each recorded the sounds. And the witnesses told us, and... We really cross-examined them over a period of days, but they told us they never saw the ship, number one. Number two, what amazed them was there was no, really no source. I mean, they could not get out of range from it. It seemed like it was everywhere, all-encompassing. they moved to the right, it was still there. If they moved to the left, it was still there. It seems I recall Wendell telling us uh, one, one evening that uh, some of the people from the nearby village started coming up because they were yes. there too. Yes, that's very true. The, the, the sound was heard at a great distance. I think it was like a half mile away. And people from other villages, uh, farmers working in the field heard it, and they came to the source. But no one ever saw anything, and that's that's what was amazing. Well, it sounds pretty fascinating. But after you, I tell you, after you see beam ships, or the movie footage, <laughs> it's not really that amazing, because when that ship dematerializes... Right in front of you. Right in front of you, and you can see almost like a light shift occur, whereas the scenery, it's almost like an umbrella appears above the craft and bends light away from the scene because the scene under and around the area where the ship is hovering becomes much darker. And it also does have this very same phenomena of a shift in light happens just before it reappears. Yes. A thirtieth of a second or something, or three-tenths of a second. There is a consistency in the time of that. Uh, it's 320ths, Bill, 320ths of a second, and it's prior and after. It's prior to the dematerialization and after it rematerializes. That's being looked at very carefully right now by uh, John Bedini and Tom Bearden and some of the other people I know who understand those things. They have an explanation, by the way. I'd love to hear it. It's very, very involved, but uh, I want you to hear it when you get into town. I would love to, and I'd love David Froning to hear that, too. Okay, does that help you? Uh, one, one more thing. Okay. Uh, what was the name of the tape again? 
the name, name of the what? The name uh, of the, the tape. Name of your oh, tape. being shipped the movie footage. We uh, we're we're calling the whole trilogy. We're we're producing a trilogy of approximately four hours uh -huh. on this case. And what we're doing is editing down 12 hours of footage shot by NTV in 79 and 80 into a four-hour trilogy. And we call it the Beam Ship Trilogy. And the first tape produced is Beam Ship the Movie Footage. And the second is Beam Ship the Metal. And it'll be available here in about about five days. Now, when you say Beam Ship, that's like B-E-A-M? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. That's what they call the ship, so right. we can't figure any reason why we should call them anything else. And I like it much better than UFO or flying saucers or alien encounters. Uh, has a nice ring to it, and that's what they refer to their ships as. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. And we have uh, Edward on the line. Good evening. Hello, Edward. Good evening, Bob Bill, and good evening, Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope you don't hear my heart, because I am so excited that you finally have somebody I can really get into. And Lee, welcome. Well, thank I you. have. I've been in contact with Genesis Lee since 1980, and I have both volumes of uh, the uh, photo journals. And, you have uh, both volumes, huh? Yeah, low one and two. Volume one. You <laughs> <laughs> I have low serial numbers too, and I also have the tape which I just received uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, received uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Could you but, hold it, Edward? Because I've got a little something I've got to do, sure. and uh, then you can have it, Lee, here as a as a. Okay, Lee. Uh, Bill said that he could never take anyone with him as close as he could get to the uh, spacecraft, and so they had to stay behind. In the beam ship movie, uh, there's a sequence where he goes up into the mountain and he sits down and you see the beam ship in the distance. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be movement of the camera. It looks like, I can't remember right now, but it's either a widening of the zoom or close up or whatever. Okay, yes. Uh, what is occurring at that point? is the Japanese film crew, they are zooming in, not Billy, not his camera. Okay. I they were taking pictures of Billy's movie projector. Before. Yes, I was aware of that, but it yeah. seems to me that uh, what I'm referring to actually occurred in the actual uh, footage, not the footage that the Japanese uh, were doing. But that's okay. I can accept that because uh, while I had the books, there was always a doubt in the back of my head about the reality of this thing. After I got the beamship footage, I said, this is it. This is for real. Uh, do you really feel that way about that footage? Well, I have an RCA VCR, yeah. and it has a special effect at the top of the line. So yeah. I'm able to not only put it in slow motion, but I can slow it down even more. Good. And uh, what happens is, when the beam ship uh, disappears in, uh, in a few sequences, right. I can slow the tape down so that when it reappears, it, it reappears slowly as a point of light that gets brighter. As opposed to just coming on, you know, which would indicate to people that it would be a fake whatever. Here is proof that this thing is originating out of nowhere. Now you understand why we release this tape. Yes, it's great. It's obvious it's not a cut film clip, isn't it? No, that's what I'm trying to say, that it is not. That it is one straight sequence. And, of course, the darkening of the, uh, the area's uh, green trees and the grass and all that, that's... Okay, that's mind-blowing. This is mind-blowing. What is happening here? Uh, let me ask you a question. On the scene, in the scene, where the ship jumps from the top of the screen to the bottom. Right. Okay, right above the knoll. Have you slowed that down? Yeah, oh, definitely. I've looked at that a million times. Oh, okay. super slow motion. Then you actually, you actually see that ship materialize in two stages. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Yes, I can confirm that. Yes, that uh, I'm not a professional photographer, although I am a professional quality photographer, and uh, I do know when some that somebody's faking something or when they're not. And at least the beam ship footage is for real. I can do without all the other before and after. Just the footage of the spaceship. That's that's worth the sixty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad By the way, you know. I like to pass this on to all those who are listening. The book UFO Contact from the Pleiades: is a preliminary investigation report. It is available. Yeah. Yeah. Order the metal tape. You'll really like that as well. Okay, you'll see my check soon. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. And thank you, Bill. All right, Edward, thank you for contributing like that. Maureen, you're on. We have uh, just about a minute, but let's get it started with you. Anyway. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks. Well, to start out with, I wanted to share with you that I've really um, enjoyed the opportunity of reading the material um, about the Pleiades. We have both of the books, 
And um, we have a very good friend who spent quite a bit of time uh, in Switzerland with Billy. Oh, really? And um, out of her visit there, a number of questions came up, and I thought maybe we might be able to address some of them for us. Okay. Start firing. I'll tell you when you have to start. <laughs> okay. Well, the first one is that uh, when she was there in Switzerland, there were lots and lots and lots of pictures available that haven't been seen previously in the books, and also many manuscripts. Um, primarily in German. And uh, we're a little curious as to why those haven't been made available at this time, or up until now. Okay, well, Maureen, you've just brought up a question that uh, is one of the reasons many of us uh, do believe that this case is real, and that's because there is so much information on it. Now, when we got involved, we had to set up priorities, and these priorities involved, thus far, have involved two books that were published, two Japanese television specials that have aired, a documentary film that still hasn't been released, but will be hopefully uh, soon, uh, and other things, and a mainstream book in the works now. So we have just, we've had to take it by the numbers, and if that answers your question with this new direction we're taking of releasing this material uh, in stages, uh, eventually we'll get to this, hopefully. Great, I understand. Well, that actually brings up one other question, which is, um, when my friend was over there, she had long discussions with Billy, and he kept saying, why don't the people in the United States know about my book? Why don't they know about my material? Have they forgotten about me? And it seems to appear that Billy doesn't realize um, financially or um, in any other way, I mean, consciously that we know about his books, that we're aware of what he's doing here in the United States. Is, is there something that happened with the rights of the book or something where he doesn't, he is not participating in this or he doesn't oh, realize no, what's no. happening? I would have to question your friend's information there because Billy has been informed all the way through. Uh, when you see the Beam Ship series, you'll see that he's in uh, this film all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, he has received various monies for his share of the rights. We have made arrangements to take care of him in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been estimated that uh, over two to three hundred million people are aware of this case. Case in point, the Japanese special played to roughly thirty million people alone. I think that's quite interesting in itself, Lee, that the Japanese did a special on Billy Meyer and turned in an audience in Japan of thirty million. Exactly. Now, for some reason or another, the great minds at ABC and CBS and uh, NBC don't think this is much of a story. Of course, you can look at what they put on the air that they think are good stories and understand, I suppose. Right. Uh, well, when PM, the PM segment ran, Bill, in 1980, that was seven minutes. Remember PM Magazine? Yes. Was on? Mm -hmm. Nacon, uh, a TV station out of Tucson, KOLD, went to Wendell, asked if they could film seven minutes. We agreed. They shot seven minutes. Uh, the major, I guess the home office, whatever you want to call it, out of San Francisco, they picked it up. It played to 50 markets. Estimated 35 million people saw this in this country. It was so well received that PM came back to us in 1981 and asked for rerun privileges. It was a most sought-after special they, they had done in 1980, and we granted this. So there are a lot of people aware of the Meyer case. And I'd have to say that uh, I don't think your friend is being very honest with this situation because I just got a letter from Billy last week. He's in fine spirits. He's very happy. He's excited about everything. And he's very much aware of everything going on. And he's not upset with us or anybody else connected with this, this program. Well, I'm really happy to hear that, actually. Um, well, there's a couple of other things that I was curious about. Um, I have heard something about a movie script um, and some rights to a movie script that possibly went over to Universal at one time based on the material. Do you Are you aware of any of that? Uh, Bill, could you repeat it? I can barely hear. She was asking about that first movie that was made that uh, went over to Universal for a while and then it's kind of floated around. Oh, that's, uh, yes, I'm very much aware of that. I'm very much aware of the writer. In fact, in 1978, I took this writer and three other people. I will not mention their, main, uh, their names at this point. One of them today is number two man 
at a major <clears throat> television network in the documentary division, but I escorted the four of them into Switzerland. They met Meyer, and then I understand a script was done, but it was never sold. And uh, I understand that every now and then we hear, we get a drift that uh, somebody's looking at it, but nothing ever, has ever been done on it, as far as I know. The, the other thing I was wondering about is, I know that it seems as if, maybe it's not actually so, but it seems as if sometimes that we are um, suppressing a lot of this information and trying to keep it out of the public's eye. And I was wondering if Wendell's having been in jail might have anything to do with that suppression of information. Well, that's a question I'd rather not get into, Maureen, if you don't mind. I think that's something that Wendell should answer, not myself. Okay, I understand. Um, and the last thing I was curious about is, have you had, had contact yourself personally with some Yazi since the time you've been in Switzerland? No, I haven't. Uh, my wife and I, we have seen light shows there late at night. Uh -huh. we, we have witnessed phenomena, which was unexplainable, but uh, I've never seen, to the best of my knowledge, I've never seen a Palladian cosmonaut, nor have I seen a Palladian ship. Sure. I understand. Willie, thank you very much for taking the time to answer my questions. Maureen, thank you for your interest. Thank you. You know, this uh, this case was the very first open mind show we ever did, was on Billy Meyer with How Wendell. Exciting. And uh, it's odd that my introduction to Billy Meyer came about a year before when I was approached to do that screenplay. Mm -hmm. When I was approached to do that screenplay. Mm -hmm. And I didn't believe in flying saucers. When I saw the material, I was more than happy to do the screenplay, but then it never did uh, materialize. Uh-huh. Well, thank you both very much. Okay, Marie. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. And, uh, Bruce. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes, I was uh, calling because I have uh, a second book by Colonel Stevens, uh, and I wondered if uh, it was possible to uh, write to the original addresses on the books to obtain more uh, books, or due to his situation, is uh, it impossible to get uh, his well, other I books? I think the best thing to do is to write to those addresses. Uh, his daughter would be glad, I'm sure, to answer your letter and advise you as to what's available. Okay. And uh, I had one other question, and that was that uh, in reading these books, uh, and I wasn't sure if I, I quite followed your answer to the uh, the other girl, but there seems to be a lot of information that uh, wants to be uh, that the uh, Pleiadians want to uh, uh, a lot of things they want to say, and I wondered if those things will be coming out in time. Well, we hope so. Uh, I, as I mentioned earlier, we've had our priorities, and there's just you know there's only so much you can do in a 24-hour period, and. Uh, Obviously, uh, it's very expensive to continue an investigation like this. In fact, we more or less terminated this case uh, as far as investigation in 1982 at the beginning. Uh, but we hope that uh, eventually, in the next three years, there will be a lot more information appearing on this case. One, and hopefully, will be the contact notes. Another will be this mainstream book, which will cover the, more or less the inside story. It's being done by a very qualified and very talented investigative reporter. And uh, it should be a very, very, very interesting reading. I think one of the things to bring up is that your involvement and Wendell's involvement was primarily in the, in, into the investigation of the case, the validity of it. And uh, that took uh, precedence in your mind. Totally. And then the wealth of material that is coming out from from this, from Billy Meyer, uh, presents a problem for us over here in that it's in German, and it is costly to translate that into American. I know that uh, when Edwin Slade was over there, that uh, this is one of the one of the things that they want to get done the most is to have those contact notes uh, translated into English, so that we can um, have those over here, because they there are some very powerful things that are said in them. Yes, and if I might add, uh, once you read uh, Wendell's uh, report and the uh, documentation and his approach to it uh, and the tests that were done, uh, uh, the entire book is uh, stating a case, but uh, now that the case is stated, I'd like to see what it's being stated about. Mm -hmm. 
anyway, uh, I do very much appreciate uh, you know all the, all that you're doing, and uh, the other the other thing that uh, I wanted to touch on, but apparently uh, Lee doesn't want to go into it, was uh, uh, what uh, Colonel Stevens is doing now, or you know what he'll be doing in the future. Well, he's writing out his current problem, and he has a lot of plans for the future. And he's in very good health. He's in very good spirits. And uh, and riding like a banshee. And we haven't heard the last of uh, Wendell. <laughs> okay? Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It's peaked in the first caller when he said he was wondering about what the message the Pleiadians had for us and what he was giving to Billy. Well, I have been corresponding with Billy Myers. And I have uh, something in a letter, I will just read a portion of it to you, which I think might be very helpful. This was December 28, 1983. I asked in my letter what I could do to be helpful to help this world out of its mess. And he says, you ask what you can do, and the answer is very simple. All the protests and demonstrations will come to naught because humanity cannot be changed as a mass. But the change for the better must start with each individual. And if you can change yourself away from a materialistic way of thinking toward a more spiritual way of life and affect the persons around you, then you will have done as much as can be expected of you, of anyone else. All the best wishes for the future. Sincerely. I thought that would uh, shed some light on what is expected of us. Right on target, too, isn't it? It certainly yeah. is. It certainly is. I mentioned earlier, I don't know if you heard this, Eleanor, but I, I, in Beamship, the movie footage, Billy talks about uh, balancing Yes. The material with spiritual. Yes. And uh, that sort of sums it up, too. It certainly does. Well, it's been a great privilege to talk with you again. And when you see Wendell, give him our very best from David and Eleanor. I certainly will. Thank and you, And much to both of you. Thank, Thank you very much, Eleanor. You're so welcome. Bye-bye. And for sharing that with us. I'm Bill Jenkins. With me is Lee Elders from promising them that we would uh, play a little bit more of the audio tape that we played a little bit earlier. Uh, and I want you to hear the sounds of the Plutian spacecraft. Now, the, the sounds seem to be real. And what we are going to hear is uh, in the control room of one of the uh, sound laboratories here in town. Which one was it, Lee? It was the Excalibur Studios. Excalibur North Studios. Holly, uh, North Hollywood, I believe. So you'll hear the sounds, and you'll hear the comments of uh, the sound engineers, who are fellows who know exactly what they're doing and what they're hearing, and also what they're seeing on their scopes, as uh, this sound that was recorded by Billy Meyer on a Phillips uh, tape recorder, as I recall, on, one on, a, on an occasion. And their excitement and a bit of perplexity about what they are hearing and seeing is quite evident. So let's uh, let's listen to that for a moment. There are probably erratic changes that you've got on the spectrum analyzer. So what is it telling you? Okay, let's pick a point here on the screen. Let's pick that point there. You see how the, the level of that point is changing? It's going up and down. Mm -hmm. that, one point on the one line on the screen here is one frequency and the whole screen is a, you might say a composite of a whole range of frequencies all the way from very low up to the top of the audio range mm -hmm. and a pure tone would simply show a peak you know one you know the line would be down the bottom and it would be straight peak up like that mm -hmm. if it was just one pure tone but since there are many tones here we get this pattern like this and as you can see, it's not steady. It keeps changing, changing. Yeah. which means the content keeps changing also in our tape or the signal. Mm -hmm. The only thing that seems to be uh, any any consistency or having consistency is the amplitude modulation. Yeah. If we look at an expanded view of the signal here, mm -hmm. you see that variation. So like that? Yes. Mm -hmm. That 
to go on the signal all the way through. It does? Yeah. That's the only stable pattern, as far as I can tell. Can you show the, the frequency of modulation, of amplitude modulation, by speeding up the, the sweep on this? I This is this is probably one of the most interesting things about the tape is that there are what's this right now? Very very many tones. Yeah, and mm -hmm. they're all changing very fast. For a moment there, we were locking in, and we had three evenly spaced frequencies. See it there again? I got them again. Yeah. yeah. Are you aware of anything that has this many tones and frequencies in it? Well, there, there certainly aren't any. Any. Well, there, there certainly aren't any. Any synthesizers that have that that have oscillators that are that many and that random tuned to that many random things all changing simultaneously that's you know that's not something inherent in any of the uh, synthesizers that are used for you know recording or creating sound this is something that has tremendous amount of oscillation at different frequencies. Yeah. So you're saying it would be very difficult to produce this electronically. Yes. But would it be possible though? Anything is possible, but in this variety? You have to consider your source. Uh, to, to create this on a, a Philips tape deck, if, if the Philips cassette came from the source that it, it supposedly came from, it's, I don't see how the man could do it. Okay, now you're running a comparison here of the sounds we're listening to, and there's the white noise down at the bottom, okay? Right. So what's the similarities between the two, and what are the, the really defined differences? Okay, well, white noise is uh, electronic, unwanted signal in any other electronic system, and you see that on the bottom here, the tones, and you can Mirage fighter that came in. And of course you've seen the photo. Oh, right, there we were. It's fascinating stuff, Lee. <laughs> uh, you've heard the second part of that, uh, the variation two sounds, uh, where the dog is barking. Yes. And the Mirage fighter. Yes. Uh huh, okay. So we get all of those other little sounds that the scope is telling everybody about. Uh, a Mirage fighter comes over, the dogs bark, and the spaceship is there. I mean, Billy must have a secret studio somewhere that <laughs> defies uh, conventional wisdom and science in order to produce those sounds on his little Phillips uh, tape recorder. Uh, we will play a little bit later the sounds of the first, his first recording. That was a variation two? Yes, sir. That was a variation six craft. The Plodeans are always changing models on us, quite like uh, they've got a connection with General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that's fascinating, too, is we, uh, by the time we got in, you know, one of the the problems with this case that I uh, will always regret is the fact that we came in two years, almost three years too late after it had started, and there were only four photographs left of the Variation One type craft, and we managed to salvage, I think we have the four, but we've never released them. One of these days we will. And yeah, they, then you'll have all six craft, and you'll see a remarkable difference 
Yeah, the latest craft is a, a weird-looking thing with great big uh, uh, balls all along the outside of it. Right. But its capabilities are evidently uh, enormous in that it can travel the distance from here to Pleiades, which is, what, 500 light years or so thereabouts, uh, in a matter of a few minutes. I think it's seven minutes, seven, seven, seven and a half minutes. And it used to take them uh, an awful long time to make the trip, seven and a half hours. Right. <laughs> <laughs> So there's obviously no CHP up there <laughs> with, a, with a speed limit. I'm talking to Lee Elders. I'll be right back in Wilton 2, by the way, Lee, at Alexandria 2 Bookstore. She just called in. They have four, I believe it is, so you have better, better hurry. And uh, they also are renting the uh, beam tape or the beam ship tape, the, uh, the footage, the Japanese footage there for you that you have an opportunity you can get yourself. For your collection, and I, this is not one of those kind of tapes, I think, that, well, if you rent it once, that'll be great, because then you'll want to buy one and uh, keep it in a very, very special place, or it may leave the door because it's quite unusual footage.